Okay, thank you. When I was preparing to come here, there were so many things on my mind. I mean, we are beginning the novena at St. Joseph, and we know Carmelites how important is St. Joseph. Should I give a presentation? St. Joseph, great. I opened some books, and, uh, and then I said, wow, this is the Eucharistic revival. It's the year to remind ourselves of the Christ's presence, in the sacrament, and the, episcop- the, ha- the, the bishops throughout the country are giving more emphasis about it. Should I make a talk on that? Mm-hmm. I also gathered some books from the library over that. As Carmelites, this is a special year. We are celebrating Therese of Rizieu, you know. And you know, for the next three years, we shall talk about, we're celebrating 150 years of her birth. We shall talk about her canonization and beatification and says, should I go to that? I also collected some books and put on my desk. <laughs> but then I said, in Lent, there are three major practices. That's fasting, almsgiving, and prayer. And as Carmelites, I think, let's talk about prayer. Because that's one of our biggest gifts to the church. And yes, I corrected books on prayer, and that's, <laughs> and that's what I'm going to share about. But my sharing today is going to come especially from the book of her life. And uh, chapter 16 onwards, that's where I want to put a lot of my emphasis today. So, as we all know, and I've titled my talk, The Practice of Prayer as a Carmelite. That's my talk. The Practice of Prayer as a Carmelite. And I've put my talk in kind of questions that we're going to ask ourselves. This is not a fast talk. In fact, you might, you might be even more expert on prayer than me. But I just said, okay, great. Let me also maybe share from a perspective that maybe will try to remind you something or enrich you. And so I came up with a couple of questions, and those questions are the one I'm going to be talking about. But basically, I'm into the book of her life. Shit. putting off those quotes about prayer that she gives us. So we all know by now that um, whenever Teresa of Avila talks about prayer, she's in fact talking about mental prayer. And uh, to her, even vocal prayer is to lead you to mental prayer. And in fact, in her famous definition of what is prayer, she begins by saying, mental prayer, in my view, is nothing but a friendly intercourse and a frequent solitude with him who we know loves us. So as she was defining what is prayer in general, she tried to go to this, that she's, she feels that she's expert in too, and that's mental prayer. And so that's the definition that we all have and we've all had for ages and ages. So that is her. And... When you look at chapter 8 of the book of her life, she talks about friendship. And uh, our Lord is a very good friend. And uh, no one has ever taken Christ for a friend without being rewarded. Also, she says the same thing about Joseph. So I think I would, I would copy from this side and this side. But yes, this is her understanding of prayer. And uh, to her, prayer is going to be more of a friendship. She comes from the background of a friendship as prayer. In fact, when she's talking about uh, um, where I come from in Uganda, I have a big, big cross. And uh, during meditation, one of the aspirants came and says, what do you do? I mean, aspirant means someone who has just come for the first day in your community and you want to know what you're doing. And, you know, after, after prayer, so we'd sit down and keep quiet. To him, we kept quiet. And to him, he thought, ah, did they mean that uh, the food will be late? That's why we are seated here? Something like that. But afterward, they were telling him that we're in two mental prayer and things like that. And uh, he asked one brother, what does that mean? And one brother said, you sit, you look at the cross that is looking at you. Anyway, very good, <laughs> very good way of summarizing everything. But uh, that tells, she takes us into friendship. And she, when she's describing friendship is, we talk to that person who is friend and who, will, who listens and he will come back to us. Now, my first question would be, what is prayer according to Teresa of Avila? I think that one I've finished. So the second one is, 
What was Teresa's avid source of understanding? Or who taught her how to pray? Have you ever asked yourself something about that? Yes, all of us, we can say, maybe my catechist taught me how to pray. Maybe my parents taught me how to pray. Maybe the school I went to. But what about to her? Who taught her to pray? Teresa of Avila addresses us not to be surprised of her contribution to prayer. She says, The Lord makes a little old woman wiser in the science of prayer than the theologians. In the book of her life, she explains that her teaching will come from what the Lord has taught me through experience and through discussion with the theologians. I mean, when we are talking about her bibliography, we know how much she talked to one Jesuit priest on how she, she went to a confession to this Dominican friar and all that. So in all those spiritual direction, in all those confessions that she had from different theologians, she was learning on how to pray. And uh, she tells us that uh, her experience and also from her conversation from others, she really learned a lot. Teresa of Avila developed a sense of practice of prayer at a quite a younger age. She and her young brother spent a lot of time talking about the glory of God that will last forever and forever. And they took delight in often repeating forever and ever, forever and ever. And so she writes later, The Lord was pleased to impress on me in the childhood in the way of truth. And uh, that is specific in the book of her life, chapter 1, paragraph 4. That's how she says. Now, one day we try and talk and say, what is Teresa of Avila's contribution towards? Like, see your divina, what we've just said. Or centering prayer. Yes, maybe she never used these two terms. But in her practice, we can see a lot of contribution that she made. As a young kid with the brother Francisco that we know of, they would spend most of the time praising God. And they knew that God is forever and ever. And that was kind of their little prayer. Forever and ever. Forever and ever. And uh, do you think that has a connection with centering prayer? Or I don't know. But yes, we can look at it in that way. <laughs> then we are told that um, after her novshet, you know, and I don't want to underlook like she went to the Augustinian school of the sisters. And there she befriended one of the sisters at the Augustinian monastery. And as she went to this school, Lily, this was a school that would teach area girls on the domestic science, how to take care of a home, how to take care of children, how to make the surrounding kind of clean. But as it was a, by, the, by the Augustinians, so the practice of prayer was there. So she befriended more this sister who was uh, at this place, And this sister taught her much about prayer. So she felt like what she had learned from home, what she was practicing with her brother, this went ahead. But we also told that um, after her novshet, now her novshet had the incarnation, and you know, we know she got sick and she was being taken to to another part of the country for treatment, but then they stopped at her uncle's place. And her uncle's place, she was given a book by Francis de Osuna, the third spiritual alphabet. The spiritual alphabet led her to begin, before going to bed, spent a little time pondering on the sinner of the Lord's prayer in the garden. And that's self right. I believe my soul gained a great deal through the custom because I began to practice without knowing what it was. The custom became so a habit and habitual that I couldn't leave it. So this book that she was given by her uncle, the third alphabet, and it's one of the most popular books in the Kamet circles, and she's the one who brings in that book, and we see that shaped a lot of... And you know, when I talk about Teresa of Avila's way of understanding of prayer, I'm talking about ourselves. As she was shaped by this book, we know we are also being shaped by her understanding of prayer. When we look at her practice of prayer, it's because we withdraw it from, from her. 
And so when I talk about this book, I'm just letting you know that sometimes how we view prayer and how we practice it also not only come from Teresa of Avila, but Teresa of Avila recognizes that she also got this practice was developed from her from this book, the third spiritual alphabet. And the other question that I came up to, as I told her, I had many books, so I had also many questions. <laughs> How did Teresa of Avila come up with a two-hour meditation? Two-hour meditation. Yes. Now, they may not be two-hour meditation as such, but uh, maybe for your case, I may talk about the two moments of prayer, like uh, the morning and the evening. Those two times you take in silent meditation at the different occasions. You may not count the 60 minutes like... Uh, 25, 30, whatever, in the morning and in the evening, but at least those two moments. How does she come up with that? In fact, you realize that um, one of the gifts that, has, that is unique to the Carmelites is these two-hour moments of meditation in the morning and in the evening. You realize that sometimes it's unique to us. Maybe other, if you've talked to other secular people, that's not part of their, their life. Maybe if you've seen, if you've stayed in, in a settings like the Russian setting, whatever, you realize that this is not. Maybe even some other religious congregation, this is not something they do. But yes, as Carmelites, this is something that we are, we treasure so much. And uh, as friars, these two hours are always spent in front of the Blessed Sacrament. But how did she come up with this? As we, we try to take some time to enjoy it or some time to feel like it has come again. How did she come up with that? We are told that um, first when we look at the rule of all of Mount Carmel, it's not there. They just tell us to keep watch at prayer, but they don't specifically give us the moments that should keep at watch. They don't tell us that. So it's not the rule. And even her has a, has a younger sister at the incarnation, this wasn't part of their life. So it wasn't there. So how does she come up with this? And yes, it's the... We are told, uh, let me try to read it. The Kamehat rule is silence on this. And two, she offers no clear indication of receiving instruction about the two-hour meditation prayer a day during her novitiate training. That is the book of her life introduction. Hence, the two-hour meditation a day on different occasions is an impact of Osuna's book on her. She so forcefully resolved to spend two hours every day in prayer of recollection or as was recommended by the author. So, these two moments we are talking about, it's a fruit that of her understanding of the third alphabet. Mm -hmm. Now I think you know how much important is the third alphabet. <laughs> Thank is you. It, is it available? Yes. Yes. Yeah, there is a translation. Yes, I would like to say, in Uganda we have only one copy and it's in glass. <laughs> <laughs> and that copy belonged to Father Christopher Laloka. I don't know whether a couple of you have, so I've seen him. So, <laughs> yeah. So, uh, but uh, we've seen a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, parts in other books about him. But yes, one full book, I know it is, we only have one, so... I don't know whether in this country we can have the pleasure of really having different copies and things like that, yes. Thank you. The fourth question that I came up with is, by the way, there are so many questions. <laughs> According to Teresa of Avila, what is our initial guide in the practice of prayer? According to Teresa of Avila, what is our initial guide in the practice of, area, in the practice of prayer? In the practice of prayer, she wrote about different initial guides and how she was guided into prayer. As I've said, that, uh, that uh, all of us have an experience of what really guides us when we come to prayer. And especially talking about mental prayer. Because to her, that is her area of interest. Other prayers are still leading us to that mental prayer. Teresa of Avila talks about books. And by the way, when she talks about books, we are talking about a person of the 15th century. If she talks about a book, it's not, it's not how they are planted today. Yeah. <laughs> books were something, whatever. 
during that time. So when you offer the book, it's one of the greatest assets that you can. The, I mean, the whole of village can talk about that so-and-so has a book yeah, during that time. So even we're talking about a time when scripture was still on in Latin. And uh, if we go into church history, we realize that those who are tempted to put some few scripture verses into the vernacular language like Spanish, there was inquisition went for them. So we're talking about that time when the book meant only the Bible and it would only stay at uh, maybe at the parish and there would be a monk guiding it. And uh, the rest you only hear what they have read and that's all. So when she says the books guided her, maybe it reminds her that she was a person of another. She wasn't, she came from a middle class family that would afford to direct the, the, to afford a book. She says, books offer material for meditation. A book can be helpful in recollecting oneself quickly. It's also a great help to take a good book written in vernacular in order to recollect one's thoughts and pray very well. Her experience in this regard is clear. In those years, 18, except for the time after communion, I never dared to begin prayer without a book. This is in the book of her life, chapter 4, paragraph 9. Now, elsewhere in the old perfection, that's 17 to 3, we will see when she mentions 14 years. Our mother wrote the way she spoke. Those things, we just enjoy them. But also we have to look at the time when she wrote this and also when she wrote the other book. So you'll hear many people trying to use the same quotings, others saying 18 years, others saying 14 years. This has to do with, are you getting from the book of her life? Are you getting from the old perfection? So that's the thing. So really, she treasured books so much. And even herself says, she spent many years, really 18 years that before she goes into this practice of mental prayer, she had to get a book to guide her. That is something that we just can't. She, the only time she said she never used a book is immediately after receiving Holy Communion. And I'm sure even at the incarnation, Holy Communion may not have been a daily. Maybe, maybe twice a week, maybe on a feast day or on a Sunday. So that was the, the church of the time. So we see her that she had very little time of uh, she had little chances of getting Holy Communion, especially in the beginning years. And uh, maybe, <laughs> even John of the Cross one day denied her Holy Communion. <laughs> she wa- wanted her to detach, and uh, detaching that time even meant to detach from this. That was John of the Cross. But I mean, what I'm trying to say is, we are not assuming that she had Holy Communion every day. Does mean that... Uh, how important is the book that led her into reading a book that led her into the practice of mental prayer was very important. Herself writes, to overcome distraction, the use of a book was very important. I spent 14 years never being able to practice meditation without reading. One book Teresa used for prayer was the little, was the life of Christ by Ludroff of Sanction. I mean, this is, a, this is a book known by the Carthusians. That's how she, she quotes it. That book from the Carthusians. That's the book, the, the Life of Christ. That book was very, very good for her to go into a practice Who of... Who is the author of that? Uh, the author is Ludroff of Sanction. So she really used that book so much to lead her into that. And uh, that's one of the guide to prayers. The other guide that she tells us is nature. And uh, you see, nature comes very well in the writings of John of the Cross. It talks about the hills and the mountain. It talks about the singing birds. It talks about... So nature was... Now, somewhere I, I was, we were coming in the car and uh, Tony talked about, oh, this press, people love to come and watch many birds. And guess what? I looked around and I wasn't seeing any bird. <laughs> so where you come from, we don't even... Uh, <laughs> in fact, they're a problem to us. <laughs> we feel like there should be few. <laughs> I come from um, a place where there is a big forest called Mabila Forest. 
and near liver Nile. So birds want to disorganize us between the liver and the forest. <laughs> and for us, is they should reduce. <laughs> Nobody should hear me. But what I'm trying to say is, she loved nature to a level that she'd use it for prayer. And the herself writes, nature has a system and a science that speaks of God. And in time, and in turn, leads to God. I try to quote. It led me also to look at fields or water or flowers. In these things I found a remembrance of the Creator. I mean that they awakened and recollected me and served as a book. When she was telling this, she was telling, you know, not everyone that would join the monastery really knew how to read and write. So we used to have the choir and we used to have the there was a privilege of just reciting the 50 Our Fathers without going into Psalms. So, the, during that time to go to a convent or monastery, you were not required to have gone through a number of classes. Though Therese of Avil herself insisted on having learnt friars and having learnt people in the monastery, and on a couple of occasions she taught sisters how to write and read by herself. Because she revived really that. But that, was, that couldn't be an impediment for you to join. So in the process, before you know how to write and read, at least you would use nature. And to her, she recognizes that nature is also as good as a book. She talks about the teacher. When she was most in need of a teacher, she did not have one. I made this quote one day when talking about spiritual direction. For during the 20 years after this period of which I'm speaking, I did not find a master. I mean a confessor who understood me even though I looked for one. This hurt me so much that even I turned back and I was completely lost. So she really talks about teachers. and I, you know, When you read her story, you'll see how much she went to Dominican friar for confession and spiritual direction, how she looked for a, a Jesuit friar, how she looked for all these kind of priests. These are people that she was considered to be teachers. They are people who taught her. She doesn't have a degree in theology, but you realize that uh, the of perfection is unmatched. The book of, I mean, her writings are so special. And they even have made her doctor of the church, which means that great teacher. But she recognizes that apart from her own experience, from all these talks that she was having with different spiritual theologians, that shaped her to understanding of prayer. And she tells us how important is a teacher and some qualities to look from a teacher. If a teacher with these three qualities, she talks about prudence, she talks about experience and learning. But we realize that if prudence and learning are not there, at least experience must be there. And if there's no experience, abandon that person is not a teacher. So that's what she tells us. Then she talks about friends. Friends, very, very important. And she says she herself has a mercy for, for a soul without a friend. And she talks about great evil is for a soul who is alone in these many dangers. And uh, people have come up to realize friends would mean a spiritual com companion, um, someone you are with into prayers. And uh, I think a few days ago I was talking to one of the mother and I said, and she's like at home where she's the only believer. The rest don't believe in anything. Her husband, her children, and I was telling her, you know, maybe after dinner, Try to switch off the TV and, and tell them that I'm going to say one our Father for you and one Hail Mary for you. And maybe they'll recognize what's the importance of prayer. Let them not realize that it's kind of a, like a game that you support alone, like supporting a football or whatever alone. Let her know that it's beneficial even to them. Involve them. Promise them that uh, this whatever is for you and this Hail Mary is for you and something like that maybe. And so she, this is when she talks about uh, spiritual companions friends are very very important on the journey and they shaped her they were her guides into the practice of prayer and they shaped her now the other thing is does Teresa of Avila teach on the body posture during mental prayer I 
before coming to, before 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 leaving coming to Uganda we were in, we were in, in a we were in a retreat as deacons preparing for the nation. And that morning the bishop came because the bishop had now being a religious on that group I I have to write Father Adam, but for the diocesan deacons I had, they had to make um they had to sign some papers with their bishop. So he came in the morning and so he celebrated the mass for us and during the preaching he talked about postures during prayer. And he says he brought it as as as, as kind of a story that is still going around my mind. He said there is a house where two a Protestant uh, minister was arguing with a, another region of Mary devotee on what is the most important or what is the most beautiful posture during prayer. The other one says, I sit, close my eyes, put my hands on the lap and breathe and that's my posture. Then I say, yes, I have a problem with my leg, so I don't cross-leg it. So I... Kind of like that. And then uh, in that house, there was an electrician who was working on the, on the electrician. He says, and the inter- intervener says, my best posture during prayer that I remember was when the rope got broken and I was swinging my legs on the, on the, on the electric pole. <laughs> And, uh, and I was yelling for help, but at the same time calling upon God's protection. That was my best posture. And uh, they all laughed. So at the end of the bishop says, we may never find the best. There are people who just want to get their rosa and walk around. There are people who would like to, walk, to sit around and things like that. But as, as Carmelites, where I come from, because we have to do it in front of the blessed sacrament and we have to do it as a community, so for us we sit. But for him, talking to his diocesan seminarians, fit priest, he would encourage them to look into these different postures and which one is best. For Teresa of Avila, at least we know that following the customs of the time, there were no chairs. All chairs maybe were very, very few. We to, we're talking about uh, the 15th century Spain. We're talking about how would they... I mean, how many chairs would, would a household have and things like that. So, we are talking about was she kneeling? Was she? How would she sit? Would she sit in a cross leg? Would she sit? So, but at least for this one, she didn't tell us herself on how she was. She did it, but at least we realized that uh, that the best way is when your body is comfortable. As this person who was swimming, who was swimming on, <laughs> on the electric pole, <laughs> he had to do it very well until he gets help. But at least that's the time he had to yell for help, help at the same time praying to his God. That was the best. So I think here we are on a call upon. I can try to read it. Teresa did not leave instruction on prayer bodily posture, following the customs of her time, where chairs were often not in use. She might have sat back in a kneeling position on her heels, or as a posture for prayer, a posture that never relaxing of the body. Lowering the scent of gravity, maybe fostering an attitude of hope, listening and receiving. What Teresa of Avia does recommend to us is to close one's eye as a mean of turning the gaze away from other material things around us. She found that this habit of recollection grows. No effort is needed to keep the eye closed. Indeed, a great effort would be needed to open them. So, it's kind of a trying to, f- to do an enough. And uh, Elizabeth of the Trinity goes ahead to tell us that uh, the indwelling Trinity is within us, so the focus maybe is eternal. The other question that I came up with is, what are the requirements for one to practice prayer according to Teresa of Avila? What are some of the requirements? Herself says that let us see this condition. And she says they are necessary for those who to follow the way of prayer. In this I quote, if they do not possess them, it is impossible for them to live a prayer a prayerful life. And if they think they are, they are highly deceiving themselves. And among these she mentions love. 
as one of the requirements for the practice of prayer. In fact, in one of her famous quotations is, Bodily strength is not necessary, but only love. Because with love, it will be a habit. And uh, <clears throat> every Friday at Santa Cruz, we go to anoint the, the, the home the home bond, is that the term? Yes. So um, the other Fridays we take for them communion. So for the, for them. So the deacon drives me around to do that. And then I met this elderly lady at her home. And um, we talk about, we're just beginning Lent by then. And I promised to her that, uh, yes, this time the mother church calls us for fasting. But at your age and your sickness, automatically you are dispensed from that. The mother church calls us for almsgiving, but yes, at your age and you are retired, you are dispensed. But you are never dispensed from prayer. <laughs> prayer, nobody is dispensed. <laughs> so I told her that as the mother church out there is praying for all her members, even those who are sick, even those who are in which, still you are called upon to join them in that, in, in the, in that apostolate. In Uganda, we have a house for the sisters, those who are elderly or maybe because of um, accidents that you go. So when you got that house, I expect people in their 70s, 80s, or people who are critical here. But every year, each person gets an appointment, and that appointment is asked either to pray for a specific need in the church. So every year. So even in their retirement, the appointment still comes. And that appointment is Sister Sanso. We request you to pray for children between this age and this. You pray for the adults and you pray for the married. So, really, and that's why herself tells us that the love is not about strength, is how much I'm strong, is how much I can do this. No, it's about love. And uh, even if when the energy goes low, really the love, it can't go low. And if the love goes low, then you've lost it. But if the love is there, it's one of her requirements that she talks about. She talks about detachment. And this is, I think we've talked more, and in your classes, more detachment about these things. Like, really, we come to God with an open heart. We come to Him with an open mind. And that if we are detached, that uh, I pray only when things are so fine at my home or with my work or my whatever, really, that's not what she's talking about. Because when we begin, she's talking about uh, a friendly conversation. We don't talk to friends on condition, especially the friend that is called Jesus. We talk to him because we know he listens and we listen. So we shouldn't put some other attachment on why I should pray. So she puts that as there is need for detachment. There is need to touch and then so that you can attach to honor God. Then she talks about humility. In understanding of humility is just seeking for truth. In fact, to her, she says, a soul that is seeking for truth is better than a proud soul in prayer. She would rather deal with a truthful person, even not yet on the journey of prayer, than one who lacks this virtue of humility, even if it's at prayer. So really, being truthful to herself, she puts that as one of the conditions. She talked about fortitude. And uh, in the modern way, we, this is what we call the determined determination. And I would like to quote this. Determine determination to persevere until reaching the end. Come may happen. Happen what may. Whatever work is involved. Whatever criticism arises. Whatever soul arrives or whatever they die on the road. Even if they don't have the courage for the trial. They are to be met. And if the world, even if the world collapses. You know, she writes this hard feeling at a time when... It was questioned. You mean a group of women are staying in that monastery and they are pra practicing mental prayer? That's a danger to the church. I mean, they'll begin hallucinating. I mean, they'll begin seeing visions. No, 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 no. They only should end that vocal prayer, and that's the end. So she comes to enter to fight back against that that was being put by the male dominance against them. So she's telling her sister of determined determination, whatever may, 
Even if so and so leaves, we should continue. Even if we lose so and so, no, we should continue. There should be nothing that stops us. So that is what, so that kind of courage, that kind of fortitude, determination, is very very important for her during prayer. Teresa of Avila herself was aware of what would be the hindrances in the practice of prayer and how we can overcome them. Even in her time, she knew that there would be things that would hinder one from the practice of prayer. And even, I was talking to an elder priest and says, yes, you have to be aware of it, otherwise you can also be a victim of this. The idea that there is no time, I think we've heard that several times. I don't have time. I'm so busy. I come from work and have to organize the home and by that I'm tired, I can't. So time would be one of the things that would take us away. Those who begin and soon tire, usually say they don't have time, as if prayer took up all their time or hindered them from fulfilling their task. To her, this is a useless and unjust complaint that they themselves don't even believe in it. For if we counted up to the end of a day, all the crumbs of time we wasted, we would see that there is a lot of surplus time. That's to her. His works are not measured by time, by these years. Thus, the time spent in prayer may be relatively longer or frequent. I mean taking time more frequent to be with the one who loves you. So for her, she says, it's not that we are scared, it's not that we don't have time, but we are scared to be by ourselves. So it's that, uh, I mean, meditation is work. And uh, sometimes it's energy consuming. The reason why, sometimes it puts you in touch with yourself. It's easier to go to your, to your car, put on the loud music, sing to yourself. Because you are in touch with something else. It's easier to come home and leave the TV throughout. Because there is someone yelling at you. But if you sit by yourself and you go through this and this total silence, then you are really coming to yourself. And many things are going to come up. So to her, it's, it's not that I don't have time to pray. It's the fear that I'm going to be in touch with there may be a painful past that I'm trying to assume never happened or things like that. So for her, she's saying that under such a situation, it's just knowing that uh, in that moment when you are by yourself, when you're talking to yourself, also it's the moment that you are encountering the indwelling trinity deep in you and that's when you're talking to Christ that do exist in you. She talks about distractions. Distractions in prayer. And we all know how much distractions have always... We felt like we're not really... We didn't feel like we've done what we're meant to do because of distraction. Strictly speaking, distractions are not a difficult of prayer, but a one way of prayer, according to her. Regarding this matter... During the restoration of the divine office, although perhaps at fault, I want to think it's due to weakness or experience in my head. And so your honor may think of this. For the Lord knows well that since we are praying, we would want to pray very well. And she says, today I confess to Padre Domingo and he told me to pay no attention to it. And I beg you to consider this as an incurable disease. The church we sit and say, the master of prayer. And we say, Pops and Pops have said, she is the teacher of prayer. Mm-hmm. And uh, even the church when struggled so much to say, can a real woman be a doctor of the church? If a woman can't be a priest, can she be a doctor of the church? At least they all agree that Teresa is a doctor of the church because she teaches us how now to pray. But again, we get a shock when she recognizes that there are many times she was distracted in the prayer. And even when she took her distractions to confession, Padre Domingo told her they're incurable. You just have to be with them. So, this is how she tells us in her writings. Even when you're talking to a friend, when something bangs outside, you'll be distracted. So to her, to her it's normal. Even when the teacher is teaching, 
And she, she says, a fly. A fly may pass around. The student and the teacher may all get distracted for that. So she tells us that distractions are normal in our life, but what we are called upon is bring them to prayer. Don't give up. But when those distractions end, let them be part of the prayer. And so, I mean, she talks about people's mind that are, are kind of jumping from one place to another. She organizes that. She organizes that not all of us have a certain mind. I can be here thinking about there, there, there. She, t- she, t- she calls it a jumping mind. But even that jumpiness of the mind, we can always call that jumpness back to prayer. And then she, she summarizes by using that prayer can still be, I mean, distractions in prayer can still be used as prayer itself. She talks about dryness. There are times when you feel like, uh, is he listening to me? Am I just talking to myself? And uh, when is he going to answer? Now, she comes in this direction that our understanding of time is different. And from the Psalms we say, a hundred years are like a single day, and a single day is like a thousand years. So really, though we've mastered the, the 24-hour clock, the 12 months, maybe we've not mastered God's time. So God communicates to us in a time that we can't understand very well. Because ourselves in the psalm recognize that his timing is not our timing. So that dryness, we must cure it by knowing that God's time is not our time. And prayer sometimes work in a way that ourselves can't explain. She talks about efficacy. This is like the results from when, uh, when I come and I say two rosaries, and after finishing the rosary, what will be the result of that? Really. To her, prayer is not like a shopping list that I go to a shopping mall and I say, I bought this, I bought this, I bought this. No, no, no. It's a conversation. It's a talk. It's a daily prayer to God. That is her understanding. Is You talk to him. And... Uh, and in talking, it's like when you're at home and we're into a conversation, not everything you said, they'll say yes, 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 yes. No, maybe you may sometimes say, no, 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 it's like this and this, not like that. So that is her understanding of that. Then she talks about bodily illness. By the way, Teresa of Avila was sickly. She spent, though we know her someone who was from this, founding this monastery to the other and to the other, but yes, she was often sick. And even we know of how many years she spent what we would call today a wheelchair, without really moving out. We know all that. So she was always sickly. And so when she comes and talks about how bodily illness and destruction in prayer, we feel like, yeah, she's talking about herself. She knows it better. And I'd like to quote, bodily illness can make prayer difficult. Teresa's advice in such a case is to avoid any effort to force prayer. To be sick, she offers this hope. And even in sickness itself, Prayer is genuine when it comes from a soul that loves. And as I told her, that, uh, that, uh, she says that uh, it's not about how strong you are, it's not about the strength you have, but it's about the love. So even in bodily sickness, it's the love that you have for prayer that will make you to memorize or something to your God or have something to talk to Him. What does Teresa talk about perseverance in the practice of prayer? And I would go back to determine determination. They must have a great and a very determined determination to persevere until reaching the end. Come what may, happen what may, whatever work is involved, whatever criticism arises, whether they arrive or they die on the road, or even if they don't have courage for the trials they are meant, or even if their whole body collapses. She really calls us to have determined determination in looking at him who is looking at us. Thank you very much. And, uh, <laughs> wow. Thank you. Thank you. The two books that he mentioned, I left them they were able, um, yeah. Tracy was able to find online. So the, they are uh, available. The uh, spiritual alphabet is really easy.